So uh, now we're going to cover module two. So you've, so far you've learned how to um, obtain the reference files, um, how to uh, get the data. Look at you looked at the data. You looked at the FASTQ formats. You've looked at the reads. You know the format of the reads. Um, you looked at the quality of the reads. How to assess them. The next step is for you to take these reads and align them uh, to the transcriptome or to the to the genome to figure out where these reads are are uh, aligning. Um, okay, is this better? Some technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so some of the learn, uh, learning objectives is of this uh, module, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the challenges that we face when we talk about RNA-seq alignments. Um, then we go, we go over some of the alignment strategies uh, for RNA-seq and pick one of the tools um, for RNA-seq alignment, uh, HiSAT, and uh, talk about the, the algorithm itself, how it works, and uh, how, how it works compared to other alignment uh, aligners out there. <laughs> Then talk about the output of these uh, aligners, uh, BAM and SAM format. For those of you who have not seen these files, we will go over the format of these files and how to manipulate them in terms of uh, sorting, for example. It's just one example. Uh, and then how to visualize those alignments using IGV. And uh, the, the second section of this module is going to be about uh, alignment quality uh, assessment. So uh, I picked one tool uh, to do the quality assessment for the alignments, but uh, uh, you don't have to use that tool. We can go over some plots that you can generate in the lab to assess the quality of the library, whether or not it pass, passes or fails, and whether or not you need to redo the library again or uh, re realign. So uh, let's start off by talking about some of the uh, challenges that we face when we talk about RNA-seq alignment. So, Sequencing technologies have advanced so rapidly over the past few years. Um, now we're generating a lot more reads than we did a few years ago. So, for example, when I started uh, uh, working on this workshop a few years ago, one lane of sequencing uh, we would generate 100, up to 100 million reads. Now, one lane of sequencing, can you can get up to 600, sometimes 700, I've seen, million reads uh, Per, per one lane of sequencing. So that's a drastic change in the number of reads that you're getting per sequencing run. In addition to that, not, uh, not only the number of reads is increasing, but also the length of the read itself. So uh, back in the days, people started doing single, single end uh, with 36 base pairs, then uh, uh, advanced to a paired end uh, sequencing, uh, 75 base pair, 100 base pair. Now people do 100, 150, up to 200 base pairs. Uh, we're talking Illumina, but if you talk back bio, you can get reads that are super long. Uh, and both the number of reads and the length of the read uh, raises a computational uh, 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 challenge because that will increase the cost. We will need resources to be able to align uh, such big number of, of reads. Now, you, you might think that this, is, this challenge is not unique to RNA-seq. DNA-seq is also having the same, same issues. What's unique to RNA-seq is the fact that introns are not present. So unlike DNA, uh, where the, the, the full sequence is present, in RNA-seq, the introns are spliced out, and you're taking those exons that are uh, being stitched together to form transcripts, and you're trying to align them to a reference genome that has those introns. So these gaps, uh, the aligner has to take care of. So that's another challenge that the aligner has to face or, or take care of. Uh, in addition to that, RNA-seq uh, is very rich. There's so much that you can get out of RNA-seq compared to DNA-seq. So uh, with RNA, you can get expression. Uh, you can get uh, variant calling, you can do splice variants, um, uh, transcript assembly, isoforms, um, uh, fusions. So there are so many things that you can get out of RNA-seq. And 
running your data uh, by one aligner and running it once is not usually the, the solution. You probably end up rerunning the alignment uh, depending on what kind of data uh, you want to get out of it. So if you want to get RNA, uh, if you want to get uh, variant calls out of your RNA-seq, you might have to tune some of the align, uh, alignment options or even the aligner to be able to use the RNA-seq data for uh, variant calling. And uh, as it was mentioned before, HiSat um, is not the only mapper that is available. There are many other uh, uh, aligners that are, that are available out there. And aligners can be classified into three classes. You have the uh, de novo assembly uh, sort of aligners. You have the ones that we align to transcriptome, and then aligners that align to uh, a reference genome. So how do you know which strategy or which aligner uh, is best suited for your data set? If we're talking about de novo assembly, usually um, if your data set or if, if the, uh, the, the samples that you're working with or uh, the species that you're working with does not have a reference available, then you might resort to using uh, a de novo uh, assembly method. Um, sometimes you actually do have a reference for your, for your uh, uh, sample, but there's so much polymorphism in the samples that you're looking at that if you try to compare it to a reference, you might actually uh, not be able uh, to, you'll, you'll miss some of the events that you're interested in. So uh, it's best if you uh, do de novo uh, assembly for, for that. Uh, if you're aligned to transcriptome, um, if you have short reads, then that would be good because the reads will only span the exon and will not span exon-exon junctions. However, if you have longer reads, then it's preferred that you uh, align to a reference uh, genome. And each one of these classes, uh, they, ha they come with a bunch of tools uh, that are publicly available. Yes? So is there a good uh, resource or way of estimating the polymorphism of frequency? Like if you, you want to work on a cow and it the deposit sequence is phosphorus, which is actually more an ancestral cow rather than a domesticated animal. One would assume there'd probably be a fair amount of polymorphism between the two. So what, you know, is there a way of, is there somebody who's keeping track of these things to give you an idea? Like I know in the mouse community there are, you know, big map and they can tell you an estimate sort of mutation rate between must musculus and must cutaneous or something like that, but are there other yeah, I'm not actually aware of any database that tracks the uh, the poly polymorphism. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not aware of uh, of any. But uh, that's a good question. I'll keep that in mind. Do you know of any? Uh, uh, if there is a, res a public resource where uh, uh, known polymorphisms, like other than DB SNP, I guess. Yeah, but just to know if you should, if you're, if you're using a, a maybe not a non non-model species, maybe an agricultural animal, and there, there's, there's a lot of agricultural animal sequence, like a pig is sequence, a cow is sequence, but you're using different strains or breeds of animals to you estimate the polymorphism frequency to know if you could just use what's deposit or if you should to know what's simple, or if you could just really try it once, if it didn't work so well, try something else. <coughs> Like in mouse, they map a lot of the uh, sequence variation between different strains of mice, so that you have an idea of what you're going to do. Yeah, but those, those systematic yeah. uh, mouse model sequencing projects. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what you don't have it comparable. Yeah. It's much harder. Sorry. Question, yeah. Just because you have longer reads, why, just because you have longer reads, are you not also? I think the idea behind it is that uh, because they're short reads, they're, there's uh, less likelihood that they would uh, go over uh, exon exon boundaries, so, so they would not. Why would short reads you don't look at the genome? Yeah. So why just because they're longer, would you still not use the transcript? You could, uh, but you have to use aligners that are splice aware if you're using longer reads. So you have to be careful when you're cho choosing an aligner. So you can't simply not choose an aligner that's not splice aware if they're long reads and they span multiple exons. I think that was the idea behind it. Like it just has to be splice aware. But, but if you've used spliced CDNA sequences, then would you do that? To, uh, you're aligning two spliced uh, DNA sequences? Yeah, so if you... Yeah, you could, you could do that. ST repositories are all spliced on... Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, 
can discover novel ones. All right. Um, so as I've mentioned, each one of these classes that I talked about uh, comes with a bundle of uh, aligners. So here's a list of some of the uh, uh, public uh, uh, aligners uh, with a timeline of when the, uh, they came out, uh, when uh, their paper, papers have been published. And you see that uh, around 2007, there was a, a spike in the number of uh, aligners. These aligners are, uh, you can, they can be grouped as RNA-seq aligners, bisulfide DNA and microRNA aligners. And um, I've highlight a few, uh, I'm going to go over a few of the uh, aligners that uh, I've either used or we've used in this wor workshop and uh, talk about uh, uh, some specifications uh, that they have and what makes them stand out uh, compared to others. So every tool when it comes out it tries to compete with others by either cutting down in processing time, uh, trying to reduce the memory used or uh, increase the accuracy of the calls or the alignments that is generating. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, Top Hat uh, Bowtie Package. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of, of, of that package. So uh, Bowtie is the backbone uh, aligner. It aligns short reads. And then Top Hat, you can think of it as a wrapper around Bowtie. It takes the information from Bowtie, uh, from the alignments, and try to assemble those reads into transcripts uh, and puts the splice junctions together. Uh, Top Hat was very popular. Uh, we've been using it uh, over the past few years for uh, th these workshops. Uh, the good thing about it is that uh, it, it has a very good community. Uh, it's very, very supported. So chances are if you're new to um, RNA-seq and you run into any issues, you will find an answer online because a lot of people have used it. In terms of processing time, uh, one lane of sequencing did take about a day to two days uh, to, to run. So that was, that, that's considered long. Um, it wasn't until uh, STAR came out uh, around 2012 uh, where it made a huge difference uh, in, in processing time. So uh, instead of one lane of sequencing taking up to two days, it was taking 20 minutes. So there was a huge uh, difference in terms of, in terms of uh, processing time. Uh, and the reason why th that happened is because they, they switched to an algorithm. The compression algorithm that they were using was different. It was uh, uncompressed suffix arrays. And the, the, the only downside to that was the fact that it was using a lot more memory. So I'll get into numbers in a bit to compare the different aligners. But using, uh, it was using a lot more memory uh, than uh, Top Hat uh, was. Uh, the tool that we're using today is HiSat, and this was released uh, about a couple of years ago, and I believe it's by the same developers of Top Hat. And it managed to um, cut down in the processing time and keep the memory low. And we'll, we'll focus on high side. I'll tell you how it works and how it does that. But just to give you a rough idea, if you're taking, uh, if you're trying to align 100 million reads uh, with Top Hat 2, it would take about a day to do that. Uh, with a, a star and high side, it would take 23 minutes to align 100 million reads. Now, in terms of memory, uh, STAR would require uh, about, I believe, 28 uh, gigs of uh, RAM versus Top Hat and HiSat, which will only require 4 gigs of RAM. So there is a huge difference in terms of the uh, RAM usage between, between these tools. So, yes? Can we use HiSat in smaller RNA? 
like micro uh, RNA? I don't know if, uh, I mean, I, I know that they're capable of aligning. Uh, I think they had a recommendation that it cannot be shorter than 30 base pairs. Uh, so the, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I know it's capable of, of aligning uh, long reads, so longer than uh, uh, 200, so they, they can do that, but I don't know if they can do uh, uh, short or even like microRNAs. Um, now, um, so when, you, when you're trying to decide on an aligner, uh, should you use a splice aware or, uh, uh, or unspliced uh, aware mapper? Uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, we're starting with uh, uh, DNA, the introns gets, gets spliced out, so you end up with mature RNA that is missing those introns, and it's just the uh, exon, uh, exon regions. So if you're trying to map uh, mature RNA back to the whole genome, you really need a splice-aware uh, aligner, because uh, otherwise it will not work. And HiSat, 2 star map splice are examples of splice-aware uh, aligners that uh, you can use. So the idea behind uh, HiSat and HiSat2 is that it, it is a splice-aware aligner. It maps to the whole genome, and it uh, uses a couple of indexing uh, methods, the uh, BWT and uh, FM index. Um, so it uses two types of uh, indexing. So there is a global search and, and a local search. And it's a combination of the global search and the local search that makes this algorithm uh, a lot faster than, uh, than others. So uh, it, takes, it takes the read and tries to first find um, uh, globally, uh, within the whole genome, it tries to find a location uh, that it can map, map it to. And then um, as, it's, as it anchors the read, the rest of the read, it tries to look for that in the uh, local uh, indices. So, what it does is that it takes, uh, the, when I talk about the local index, we're taking the whole genome and we're splitting, splitting it into bins. Um, and there is about 48,000 uh, local indices or local bins that are overlapping uh, in, the, in the genome. Um, and this will just cut down, cut down on the search time. So instead of searching the whole genome for a read, you're searching within uh, specific areas or specific spots uh, in the genome uh, for, for that read. So I'll walk you through um, three different scenarios just to show you how this algorithm works. Um, the, so right over here we have, uh, this is just a, a piece from chromosome 22 uh, where you have an exon, intronic region, and another exon. Um, these are, the, uh, the red chunks are the reads. And um, the, the three um, techniques that I'm going to highlight are the global search, the local search, and the extension. So the three scenarios will go over uh, three different types of reads that we can, we can obtain. So scenario A will, will go over a read that fully, is fully obtained within an exon. So it's not overlapping any uh, splice junction boundaries. Whereas uh, scenario B, we have a read that most of the read uh, aligns to uh, or, or goes over exon 2 but only a small chunk of the read uh, actually goes over uh, exon 1. And the third scenario, we have half of the read uh, overlaps exon 2, and the other half uh, overlaps exon 1. So in the first scenario, where we have the, uh, the full read uh, uh, going under uh, exon 1, what the first thing that happens in HiSat2 is it tries the global uh, search. So we'll try the global search, we'll look through the whole genome to try to find a spot for that read, it does that uh, by looking first at the, tw the first 28 bases in that uh, read. And then once it finds a spot in the genome, it stops after 28 bases and just simply extends. It doesn't have to look anymore. It just continues to extend. Uh, if there are no mismatches, then it will just continue to extend until it uh, reaches the end of the read. Now, for scenario B, uh, it will start off by doing the same thing. So it's going to do a global search look for the uh, first 28 uh, bases, it finds it, then it starts extension, it's going on, up until this point, it hits the first mismatch. And that first mismatch is because there is a splice junction. So it stops. And that's when it switches to local search. So when it stops right here, there are eight bases left uh, to the read. 
So it switches, now it takes those eight bases and tries to find uh, the position of those eight bases. And this is what makes HiSat different from Top Hat, the fact that it's using this local index. Remember these bins that I talked about? Um, in Top Hat 2, it used to take these two, uh, eight bases, sorry, and look throughout the whole genome to find if there is a match for these eight bases. And you might know that the shorter the read, the less unique it is. So you'll probably find so many different spots in the genome that you can align these eight bases, and that, that complicates things. The cool thing about this local search is that now it doesn't actually have to go through the whole genome to find uh, a, a match for these eight bases. Because it started the global search, we know where the beginning of the read is. Now we just focus, narrow down the search on one bin instead of looking at the whole genome. And the chances are you only find one match for those eight bases in that bin instead of finding so many different matches somewhere else. So it will switch to local, find uh, uh, a match for uh, those eight bases, then we'll com uh, combine the, the results from this chunk and this chunk and we'll report the alignment for that. Now the third scenario, we have half of the read aligning to an exon and the other half aligning to the other exon. Again, first step, you start with global search, the first 28 bases, you anchor uh, the first part, uh, after 28 bases, you uh, stop, you start just extending, 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 until you hit this spot right here where there is a splice junction. It, stop, it stops and then switches to a local search. And um, the local search only does the first eight bases. So global search will do 28 bases. Local search, you will only do the first eight bases. And then after it finds the spot uh, using the local search, and then it will just continue with the extension. And then we'll combine the uh, the results of the uh, the alignment. Yes. Can you tell the difference between a splice junction and a variant? Uh, I think you can specify the number of uh, mismatches that you can allow. So that's so something that you can control. Yes. And uh, also you can provide it with um, uh, SNPs, uh, known uh, uh, germline variants, and uh, splice sites, uh, annotated splice sites. So it can use that information uh, to. Uh, skip regions or, or distinguish between splice variants and uh, SNPs. Um, the other question that uh, you might get asked uh, when you're uh, aligning this data is, uh, did you keep all the reads, uh, the multi-map reads? So when we're doing DNA sequencing, uh, what ends up happening sometimes is that there is a read that maps to multiple locations in the genome and it maps with the same exact quality. Uh, uh, across different sites in the genome. So what the aligner does is that sometimes it just picks, randomly picks one of those uh, uh, alignments and then it reports that. Um, so an RNA-seq, uh, it really depends what you're doing. So if you're doing variant calling, sure you can do that. However, if you're doing expression estimation uh, after you align, then it's highly recommended that you do not do that, and you actually report all the possible alignments that are available. Uh, and the reason why you want to do that is you don't want to affect the dynamic range of the expression, what if there are genes that have uh, the, the pseudogenes, whatever, uh, that have the, the same expression or the reason map to multiple uh, uh, locations in, in the genome. You want to maintain that when you're, when you're talking about expression and not... Uh, uh, not get rid of those reads, just report report everything. Um, so what do you get out of uh, HiSat after you run, run the alignment? 20 minutes after, you get a SAM file. Uh, so a SAM, SAM, SAM stands for Sequence Alignment Map Format, and it is, um, it's a text-like file, so you can open it, uh, you can uh, do a head or more or cat, uh, it's not recommended to view the whole file because it's going to be a, a giant, a giant file. Uh, but the idea is that you can you can view it using uh, text editors if you want. However, the, uh, the BAM is the binary version of that file, and that's what usually uh, you'll end up converting your SAM into a BAM. And the reason why you do that is because you want to save space, um, and a lot of the tools downstream will probably accept BAM formats. Uh, the only downside to that is that you cannot easily uh, access the uh, reads, uh, aligned reads inside the file. You'll probably need other tools that will enable you to uh, view the alignments. Uh, there are other uh, uh, formats that uh, uh, 
that you can use. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and then there are different tools that you can use to convert SAM, SAM to BAM or BAM to SAM. <clears throat> So this is what a BAM file looks like, if you haven't seen one before. Uh, it's divided into uh, two parts. You have uh, the header, which contains information about the run and the alignment, and then the, uh, the body, which contains the actual uh, sequences that you passed in, in the FASTQ file. Uh, after uh, the alignment, it will add information uh, like where it was aligned and so on. We'll go, we'll go into details of uh, uh, what's in there. The other um, uh, format is CRAM. I don't know if you've heard uh, of that. It's, uh, it manages to compress the SAM in a very efficient way and really reduces the footprint. However, you have to be careful when you're choosing a format, a compression format, because you want to make sure that the tools that you're using downstream, whether it's expression, fusion, calling, uh, they support uh, that, uh, that that compression uh, format. Uh, BAM is widely used and uh, acceptable. A lot of tools uh, use it, so you should be fine uh, with 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 BAM files. And Obi talked about uh, uh, indexing and how indexing is uh, useful. Uh, BAM file also needs to be indexed as well. So uh, there are tools you can run to index a BAM file. And the reason why you want to index a BAM file, again, if you're, let's say you're interested in pulling reads from a certain region uh, in the genome, you don't want the, you don't want to go through the whole file if you're looking for a read on chromosome uh, 22. You don't want to go through all of the chromosomes to get to that read and then pull it out. What You want to get it out faster, so that's why you index the BAM file uh, and that will make it easier to pull out specific reads or specific regions from uh, the, the, the BAM file. So what does the... Uh, I mentioned that the header section of the BAM file contains information about the, the, uh, the, the, the run that you've done, the sample, so uh, this is a list of uh, the exact information that is contained within the header. So uh, uh, bless you. The header line um, has a, a format version. So that's the format of the uh, BAM file that uh, you're using. How SO stands for sorting. How was it sorted? Is it sorted by uh, read ID or is, is it sorted by uh, position or whether or not it's sorted at all? Um, Reference sequence dictionary, so uh, reference sequence name, is it uh, GRCH37, GRCH38? It also provides the uh, sequence length per chromosome and uh, the species that you're uh, dealing with. Read group, uh, just like the uh, read uh, uh, group in the FASTQ file that you looked at, uh, the, uh, the read group in the BAM file also contains information about the, um, the, the library, um, so that can be uh, useful, the name of the sequencing center and the sample name or the patient ID. Uh, finally, the program that you use to uh, perform the alignment and uh, also the uh, program version. And usually it has the command, actual command that you use to run the uh, aligner so people know what parameters you use to generate this uh, specific BAM file. Um, so that was the header. Now we move to the, uh, the body of the BAM file. Uh, and it contains information about each uh, read that you passed. It aligned it, and now it's telling you where it aligned it to and uh, what was the quality of that aligner. So um, let's walk through an example of uh, al alignment here, and we'll walk through all the different columns that you'll find uh, in the BAM file. So the Q name starts for the uh, query name, so this is the uh, uh, read ID. Um, flag, I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, R name stands for the chromosome, so that's saying that this read aligned to chromosome 1, uh, position uh, 11, 6, 2, 3. Uh, mapping quality is 3, so that's FRET score, uh, which stands for the negative log 10 of probability that this was uh, a mismatch. So the higher the uh, mapping quality, the, the better. The cigar uh, string, I'll also talk about that uh, in, in a bit. Uh, R next is just saying, uh, does, does this read have a pair and uh, where is the pair? So equal means that the pair of this read uh, aligned to the same chromosome. So it's also on chromosome 1 and this is the position of the, uh, the, the mate pair on chromosome uh, 1. And then you get the actual uh, sequence and then the quality for each base within uh, that sequence that you try to align. So the two things that I skipped here, the flag and the cigar, cigar string, and I said I will uh, talk about them uh, after. So 
the the flag um, is a is a twelve uh, bitwise uh, uh, describing. It's a num twelve bitwise number that describes the alignment. So you can think of it as one way to consolidate eleven columns of data describing uh, the the quality of the alignment. So we're taking these eleven columns of information and then squishing them into one number, and that one number can tell you a lot about the uh, the alignment. So it can tell you information such as um, if if there are uh, if, if this read is unique or if it mapped to multiple places, it can tell you information like if it's the first uh, read in the in the pair or it's the second read in the pair, whether or not the read aligned or didn't align. Um, if it's a primary alignment, if it's a secondary alignment, uh, if it's a PCR artifact, if it's a, if it's a supplementary alignment, uh, and so on. So let's take a uh, a second and try to. Uh, to, to use a, a web page, so there is a web page, because you can't really, uh, if, if I give you a number, you can't really uh, do it in your head. Uh, it, it's hard because it's a, it's a, a bitwise number. So we'll, there is a page where you put the number and then it tells you exactly uh, what information uh, that codes for. So if we go back to the example that I showed you, uh, the flag in this case was uh, 99. So Let's try this. So if you just search for explain SAM flags, uh, this page will uh, come up. Maybe I should increase the size. So here, for example, 99, that was the flag that we're trying to look for. So once you hit explain, it tells you, it, it checks the boxes. Um, so 99 stands for uh, that the read is paired, uh, the read is mapped in a proper pair, uh, the mate is the reverse strand, and this read that we're looking at is the first uh, in, in the pair. Um, so, yeah, as, as I said, you can put in uh, any number that you want in that within that range, and uh, it will break it down for you. Now, why is this important? It's important because if you're trying to subset a BAM file, um, you can use SAMTools view, and there is a parameter in SAMTools view where you give it this number, and it will pull all the reads that fit these criteria or these conditions. So if I'm interested in all the reads that fit these four conditions, all I do is samples view dash f and I put this number and it will pull all the reads in my file that fit uh, these specific conditions. If you want to change the conditions, you can actually um, check all these conditions and it will change the number for you and you go back and use samples view to pull uh, those, uh, those reads. So you can either uh, pull the reads that, uh, uh, that satisfy this condition, or you can exclude reads that uh, satisfy this condition by using dash small f dash capital F. Um, so I find, I find that pretty useful. I use it uh, quite often. So that was, that was the flag uh, parameter. Now, uh, cigar strings. You can think of cigar strings are a, a sequence of base lengths. So what, what a cigar string is doing is that it's try, trying to describe the alignment status for every base in your read. So if you have 100 bases in your read, uh, the cigar string is trying to give you some sort of a code to how each one of the bases aligned within those 100 reads. So if we take this string as an example, it's saying that it's 81M859N19M. So M, if you look at the table, stands for an alignment match. And N stands for a skipped region from the reference. So what this is telling me is that out of the 100 reads in my read, the first 81 matched to the reference. Then the, the aligner had to skip 859 bases. And then it was able to match 19 bases. And what, that, uh, what the 859 stand for is this splice junction. So it's saying that I tried to align it to an exon, and then there was this gap that I couldn't align, which stands for a splice junction, and then there was 19. So the 81 plus 19, anything that matches should add up to 100 or the length of your uh, read. Uh, and uh, you will get other letters like soft clipping, hard clipping, and, uh, and so on that uh, can be useful to uh, visualize. So I believe that's what... Um, uh, IGV uses to for visualization. It tries to uh, read this cigar and and uh, visualize it on on the screen. Um, so I've mentioned one way to subset a uh, BAM file is by using those flags uh, uh, 
that I I've talked about before. Uh, another way, if you're interested, uh, for example, in subsetting uh, a region or a gene or uh, a, a small, uh, as I said, region in the, in the genome, sorry. Uh, if you're trying to subset a small uh, region in the genome, what you can do is uh, you can uh, you need to provide uh, another file, which is called a, a bed file. And in that bed file, uh, you specify the chromosome, the start, the end, and the uh, uh, ID. So uh, if you're looking for gene A on chromosome 22, you say chromosome 22, this is the start of my gene, this is the end of my gene, and uh, my, my gene is called gene A. And you, uh, there are tools where you take the BAM file and you take that BET file and you can subset the BAM file to only pull reads that uh, belong to that specific uh, region or those within are within those coordinates. Uh, so you can create a mini BAM for your gene, for your uh, transcript, um, uh, and so on. Can you yes. Do that with the GDF file? Um, you. I don't know if you can subset. Usually, it's a it's a bad file. Like if you're using bad tools, then you will need a bad file uh, to do that. Uh, but that's just one usage of bad uh, formats. Uh, you'll find uh, if, well, once you work with. Um, uh, RNA-seq data or other types of uh, uh, data sets, you'll find that uh, beds are very useful uh, file formats. Um, so, so there are a lot of tools that you can use to manipulate these uh, BAM files, subset them. Uh, this is just a small list of some of the tools that you can use. Uh, SAM tools, as I've mentioned before, you can use it to uh, view files, subset files. Uh, BAM tools, Picard, uh, you can use that to sort uh, your, your BAM file. And for uh, uh, BET files, you can use BET tools, you can BET, bet ops, and uh, there are a lot of other tools out there that you can use, but these are the most uh, common ones. Um, in terms of uh, sorting, there are two different ways that you can sort your BAM file. You can sort it by position uh, or by a read, read name. Uh, if you're sorting by pos position, uh, this is mainly for uh, performance uh, reason. If you're trying to pull uh, a specific uh, read from a specific coordinate, then it'll make it easier that way to, uh, to, to pull uh, uh, the reads from the BAM file uh, faster. Uh, however, if uh, you want to sort by uh, read ID, the reason why you do that is uh, if you're interested in uh, read pairs. So if, uh, if you're interested, for example, for fusions and you want to see if, uh, if the, the pair, um, uh, you want to pull the information from the pair and see if they align to the same chromosomes or different chromosomes and, and or uh, how far apart those uh, two reads are. So yeah, two different options for aligning your BAM file. and. If you have a BAM file that's already aligned, as I've mentioned, you look at the top in the header and it will tell you how this file was aligned, whether it was uh, sorted, sorry, how, how it was sorted, how it was sorted by coordinates or uh, by position. Uh, a lot of the tools downstream of BAMs, um, if you want to use them, then they require the BAM file to be sorted. So that's the first thing that you need to do after you uh, get your BAM file. If it's not sorted properly, you make sure you sort it before you do expression analysis or anything else. And as I've mentioned, uh, one way you can, to visualize the BAM file after you've generated it is to uh, look at IGV. You guys have seen IGV before. Have you used it before? Yeah. Um, so I don't need to uh, go get, get into details, but uh, this is the, uh, the, the chromosome, uh, the, uh, whatever chromosome you're interested in. Uh, in this case, I think it's chromosome 3. Um, and then uh, these are the piles uh, of the reads. Uh, we have, uh, this is the gene annotation, so these uh, islands represent exons and uh, these lines that connect them are in tronic regions. And uh, uh, you expect to see exons piling up, uh, sorry, reads piling up uh, on exons and not really on uh, introns unless there is a novel discovery, uh, a novel exon that you have not, uh, have not been, has not been annotated before and you discovered it in your uh, data set, then that could be a reason why. All right, um, so now we're going to move to the second section. So now that you have the BAM file, you've sorted it, you want to find out if um, your library worked, if the, uh, uh, the library was good, if the alignment uh, worked. So um, you can do alignment QC. 
just like we did with uh, fastq file, we did fast fastqc uh, in uh, the BAM file. You can use fastqc. However, fastq fastqc is not really uh, um, implemented to assess the quality of a BAM file. So what it's doing is it's checking the sequences, but it's not checking how well the alignment uh, was 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 done. So it's just, it was just checking the uh, the sequence quality from the sequencing, not the alignment. Um, there is a tool called RCC that you can use to um, uh, to get all the metrics that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, or you can implement these metrics yourself. I'll show you how. Uh, it's very straightforward. So some of the metrics that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at three prime, five prime bias, uh, nucleotide content, uh, base and read quality, uh, how to assess PCR artifacts and what to do with it, uh, look at sequencing depth. Uh, base distribution and insert size uh, distribution. So uh, the first thing to do is the three prime, five prime uh, bias. Um, the way the tool does it is that it takes the top thousand uh, expressed transcripts and then it divides, uh, and of course these transcripts are going to have different lengths, so it takes the transcripts and divides, divides each transcript into hundred bins. Uh, so that it, uh, it normalizes the, the length of the transcript. So it takes all the different tra transcripts and then it uh, divides them into 100 bins and then it does read count per bin. And that's what we're plotting. So um, from 0 to 100 percentile within the, uh, the, the gene body, uh, we're looking at the coverage for each one of these uh, uh, bins or percentiles. And what you expect, you expect to see even coverage uh, across your transcript. And here we have two uh, batches of samples, one batch where we are seeing a uniform uh, coverage across the transcript, but we're seeing another batch that has that seems to have a lot more coverage at the three prime site versus the five prime site. And this usually uh, raises a red flag. It's, uh, it, it could be the library construction technique that you used. Uh, maybe this was a poly A selection. Uh, it, 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 there's a bias towards a three prime. Uh, or, or it could be a degradation uh, in your sample. That's why uh, you're not seeing uh, the, the transcripts are being degraded at the five end. And that's also not a good, uh, a good sign. So you might, if you see this, you want to go back check uh, what caused this, uh, if it was the library technique, switch the library technique. Um, if you can't, then there are tools out there that you can use to adjust uh, and uh, normalize for such uh, artifacts. I believe it was mentioned here before when uh, uh, I think Obi was doing the FASTQC, um, that there is, um, uh, there is a way to check uh, nucleotide content. You expect the nucleotide uh, uh, content to be uh, uh, proportional for ACGT, around 25% uh, throughout the read. Here we're looking at uh, within uh, uh, each base of the read uh, from 0 to 35. We're assuming that this is a short read, it has a length of 35 bases. For each base within that read, we're looking at the, uh, the, uh, the nucleotide content. Um, and as was, as it was mentioned before, uh, the first um, let's say 10 bases, there seems to be uh, this, this uh, bias in terms of the uh, number of, of nucleotides. And uh, the claim is that the, uh, it's the random uh, prim primers that are used uh, uh, to transcribe the uh, RNA to cDNA, uh, they use these hexamers. And these hexamers, they're just uh, chunks of uh, DNA that bind to the RNA. And we need that in order for the transcriptase um, to uh, initiate, just like a polymerase. Um, and these, apparently, these hexamers, uh, they're six-based, they introduce a bias. So they, they're, they have a preference to certain uh, uh, bases when they bind to uh, the, the fragments, uh, and, and that bias is causing this. So um, it's usually not a big deal because it's not really happening at a fixed point. It's happening at the beginning of the read, and you usually have a lot of read that overlap um, around the region. But it's 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 best to um, generate the, the plot, see what it's like, uh, see if you can avoid it by using a different uh, library technique strategy, um, 
or, or if you want to uh, to trim the first few bases of your read, if you have a long read and you can afford to trim the first few bases, then you can go ahead and, and do that uh, and then align and see if there is a difference uh, between the, the alignment before and after you trim for uh, those bases. Um, quality distribution. So here we're looking at, uh, again, the 35 bases uh, read length. We're looking at the quality of each base within uh, the read, uh, compiled across all the reads uh, in the library. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, uh, FRET uh, score is used, and FRET score is a negative log 10 is the p-value, the p being the probability that the base calling is wrong. So if you have a q-value of uh, 30, that means that there is one in a thousand chance that uh, you got the base wrong. Uh, so 30 is usually the, thre the threshold that is uh, used when um, uh, we assess quality. So you want everything to be uh, above Q, uh, Q30. If you see anything below Q30, uh, there are a few options you can do. You can either trim uh, those bases and a lot of uh, uh, tools that trim, you can actually specify not just how many bases you want to trim, but you can tell it, okay, trim anything that is less than this uh, Q value or this score. Um, the quality here is good. Everything is above 50, so that's 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 good. PCR uh, duplication. So duplicated duplicate reads are reads that have the uh, same the, ex the exact same start and end position. Um, and when you're doing DNA sequencing, one thing you want to uh, avoid is you want to avoid pile up of reads. So if you're looking through IGV and you're looking at a region and you see this region that has this pile up, so all these reads that have the same exact start and end, uh, you don't want that. The reason why you don't want that is because if there is a variant in that region, uh, it will be amplified. And this amplification is not uh, biological, it's actually artificial because it's PCR. So PCR uh, is the process where you try to duplicate the reads to get more uh, more more reads, um, and it uh, the the error will propagate if you if you don't collapse your data. So what we end up doing is that we collapse all the reads and we only keep one read if they have the same start and end position, um, and that works with DNA sequencing because. Um, you expect to um, uh, the, the start sites of the fragments to be randomly distributed across uh, the genome. Uh, there aren't specific starting sites when we talk about DNA uh, seq. However, with RNA seq, the case is a bit different. You want to be a bit careful when you uh, when you choose whether or not to collapse, because um, there are actually fixed starting points in, in the genome. And these are the transcription sites. Uh, that's where the, the transcription uh, uh, begins. Um, so, so these pileup of reads could actually be uh, just a sign of transcription sites. And you, if you collapse them, that will actually affect the dynamic range of your expression values. So you have to be super careful to uh, distinguish between uh, an, a true PCR artifact or uh, a biological uh, transcription site um, that's causing these uh, uh, PCR-like uh, artifacts. So um, this plot can help you uh, assess how severe this problem is, and based on that you can uh, decide whether or not you want to collapse. So here we're looking at the number of reads and the uh, occurrence of reads, so that's how many uh, duplications uh, we have. So you expect a good library, you want it to uh, look something like this. If, it's, if you get something like this, where uh, a, a big number of reads has very high uh, duplication rate, then again, you might want to go back and check uh, the library technique and see if there is something that you can modify to get rid of this. Another question that gets asked is sequencing depth. How, how many lanes of data do I need? how many samples can I actually uh, multiplex uh, within the lane uh, to, to um, be able to answer my research question. So this is very much uh, dependent on what you're trying to do. So with, with DNA sequencing, it's pretty simple because you can just look at the average coverage and you can say, okay, I, I want to uh, sequence so that I have 40x coverage. I want every site in my genome to have about an average depth of 40 reads. The problem with RNA is you cannot do that because the expression of the genes vary. Some genes have very high expression, like housekeeping genes. Other genes are not expressed at all. So there isn't one number that you can pick and say, that's my distribution across the transcriptome. 
Um, and not only that, but also it really depends what you're, you're doing. Are you assessing expression? Are you looking at fusions? Are you doing variant calling? And for each one of these, you will probably need a different threshold um, and different uh, uh, coverage. But one way that you can uh, kind of assess uh, how many reads you, uh, you, you will need is by looking at this plot, which is uh, a splice junction saturation plot. So what this is doing, what the tool does, it takes your BAM file, the full file, and then it randomly samples different levels of that BAM file. So it samples 10% of the file, 10% of the reads, 20% of the reads, 30%, up to 100% of the reads. And for each level, each sampling level, it will try to find the number of splice junction uh, detected, novel and known. And it will make this plot. And what you're looking for, you're looking at a point at which the, uh, there is saturation in the number of uh, junctions that you detect. The saturation means that beyond this uh, uh, number of reads, you're not actually detecting any new splice junctions. Obviously, there's going to be a difference between novel and known because there, is, there are probably false positive uh, splice junctions in your data set because of the aligner that you use or the splice detector that you use. So here, for example, the known junction uh, curve saturates a lot earlier than the, uh, uh, the, the, than the novel uh, uh, junction. So it's, it's a balance between uh, the known and the novel. You want to pick a point at which um, uh, both start to kind of saturate or, or slow down. And at that point, you say, OK, this is probably the number of reads that I will need. I don't think I need anything more than that. So um, you can do that. You don't have to do that for all the samples. Maybe you can run one sample, uh, do one lane or two lanes, and then do this kind of experiment, see the number of splice junction um, uh, that, uh, that, that are saturated, and then go back and apply this uh, desired number of reads to the rest of your samples if they all have similar conditions um, biologically. Uh, another way that you can do it, if you don't want to look at splice junctions, uh, you can look at the number of uh, uh, genes, number of expressed genes, or number of new family of expressed genes that you get per sampling level. So instead of looking at the number of splice junction, you can look at, am I, am I actually um, uh, seeing new family of genes that are being expressed as I increase the number of reads? And again, if you reach a point where you're not seeing a big difference, you're not seeing new genes, then maybe again, that's a point at which you can draw a line and say, this is, this is uh, sufficient. One question, is this also done by RCC or? The sampling is done by RCC. So all you need to do is pass it uh, I think it only requires two files. It needs the GTF file and it needs a BAM file. Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, you can you can always uh, downsample the the first sample that you did. If it was 100 and you only needed 50, you can downsample that, and then just to make it at the same level as everything else. Uh, but again, I would have to make sure that the the other conditions they they match the condition that you tested, just to make sure that uh, there is no polymorphism or something that's different about these samples that might uh, or they might require a bit more reads. So as long as they they're under the same condition, they're very similar. And I would, I would have a range as well. Like if you, if you think it's 50, then you would do maybe add a bit of a, a buffer just in case. Um, another plot that you can generate is the, um, the base distribution. So here we're looking at uh, out of all the bases that we aligned, uh, what does uh, the distribution look like? What percentage of these bases are coding? Uh, what percentage are there UTR and tronic and, and so on? And that will give you an idea of what library was uh, used. Uh, if you had no idea what library was used, uh, uh, whether it was a whole transcriptome or a poly A, then doing this plot will give you an idea what was used. And if you see something that is strange, then again, you go back and then um, you, you uh, talk to the people who prepare the libraries. Um, for poly A, uh, you're expected to see a lot more coding bases uh, than a whole, whole transcriptome um, and so on. Um, another 
a check that you can do is you look at the uh, insert size uh, distribution and there are so many uh, terms that are used interchangeably when we talk about insert size. Uh, you see fragment size, you see insert size, you see inner mate. Uh, when, uh, if people use uh, top hats, you, that term is used in, uh, in there. And it can get confusing, and they don't all mean the same thing. They each, each term means something different. And you have to be careful uh, of what you're plotting. Um, so when we're talking about uh, fragment size, that includes the... Um, the uh, the, the, the fragment that you're trying to sequence, beginning of read one and to read two, with the adapters. Um, that's fragment size. Insert size is usually uh, the fragment without the adapters, and the inner mate is uh, the distance from the end of read one to the beginning of uh, read two. So uh, depending on what you're pl plot plotting, uh, the distribution will probably look the same, it's just that the numbers might be a bit different uh, whether or not you've included the uh, adapters or not. So you just have to be careful. Um, so here, for example, we are plotting the insert size distribution and um, this just gives you an idea of how um, uh, what the, the fragment size was and how long your uh, reads are. Uh, the closer the number to zero, uh, the, the, it means that you're, uh, you're, you're close to actually sequencing into the adapter because your reads might be too long and your fragments are a bit short. So this will give you an idea of how, uh, if your library was too small and if your reads were too, too long, you can adjust, go back and, and adjust. Uh, here you're seeing bimodal distribution, uh, which is usually not a good sign. It means that uh, there's probably, um, uh, when size selection was done, there probably two sizes were selected, uh, or there is some sort of uh, degradation that is uh, causing this uh, the, the, the different um, uh, modes in your uh, data set. They can be negative if your fragment size is small and your read length is uh, longer than the fragment size. So let's say that you're, you're doing um, two by 100 and your fragment size is 80. So you start, you, you, uh, you sequence the 80 bases of the fragment, but then you sequence minus 20 into the adapter. So yeah, you end up sequencing the adapter. And you wanna avoid that. So when you see that, you either you can either, uh, well, trim adapter or uh, shorten your read length. Um, um, that's these are the two choices that you have to avoid that problem. Um, you can also, if you're looking at uh, variants, um, there are, I'm not sure if there are tools that are uh, specifically designed to call variants from uh, RNA-seq alignments. I mean, you can try uh, you know, GATK, um, and they might, they might have something that's specific for RNA, but another way, if you're interested in a specific gene uh, or a region, you can always use IGV and look at uh, reads uh, in IGV and uh, usually any alteration that is present in terms of uh, SNVs or SNPs, uh, you, will, you will see that uh, the, the base will be uh, color coded and this is just saying that the reference is a C and you're seeing uh, a, T, a T here. Uh, you, might, you might have some DNA seq data and you want to do some sort of uh, validation and you look at, you look at your RNA seq uh, data set just to make sure that the variant that you saw in your DNA is actually present in RNA. So that's one approach that you can do. You can just go back to IGV and then check to make sure that that variant is present in RNA. Um, so that gives you uh, more confidence that this variant is, is uh, not an artifact. It's actually there. Uh, can I ask something? Can you compare yeah. the two? So let's say you have like the same sample and you try to do variant calling based on the DNA sequencing yeah. and the RNA sequencing yeah. the same sample. Yeah. Is it true because of like, the difference in the group reading activity of the polymerase, the RNA polymerase versus the DNA, you get like less variance if you do the DNA and if they just RNA polymerase to get an overestimation of the number of variants? Um, that's possible. Also, uh, you have to keep in mind that in RNA alignments, you're doing uh, splice detection, mm -hmm. so there is probably a high false positive rate. So when you're when you're looking at variants, uh, make sure that you check how far they are from the, the splice variants, because uh, if pro if you probably do a heat map, you'll see that there are hot spots of false positive variants around the splice sites because the tool is trying to find the splice junctions. It estimates that it's not proper. 
and it creates mismatches, and those could be false positives. So there, you, there, you will have more false positives in SMBs and RNA uh, or, or variants in RNA. So you just have to be careful there. All right. Thank you. Thank you.